Good afternoon and welcome to Nottingham Poetry Festival's Fringe event. We can't wait to show you the poetry that we've got on offer this afternoon. We'd love to thank our sponsors, especially Arts Council England, who this year have made it possible for all Nottingham Poetry Festival events to be completely free. So head over to the website and check out what you can get booked onto. First up, we've got Dr. Martin Glynn, Poetry Aloud, and the Fighting Nightingales. See you on the other side. Sunshine After the Rain by Anne Glynn. Sunshine after the rain, comforting cliche, homage to hope. But what help are empty platitudes to those who, drowning in the deluge, will not live to lift their face and feel the eternal sunshine? Chainmail by Dave Wood. Dear I, myself writes to you or I, as you or I need to let go. You or I restrict me, chain me in, hem my shoulders to a tight squeeze. How would this help me when the pen is ready? You or I need to let go. Find someone who's happy in themselves. A body who prefers to be vertical, constant, the moon, that dot, never waxing, waning, whatever bars you or I wear, it is like a chainmail dragging down my feet. Welcome to Poetry Aloud Presents. Today we're going to be looking forward with hindsight. Now that's a good title for this year, don't you think? It's almost as if we thought it up last year in advance with hindsight looking forward. Hmm. Anyhow, today Poetry Aloud is presenting to you Katie Gearing, Michelle Mother Hubbard and Paul Carbuncle guest appearances from Dixie, Cat, Random Intervals, obviously, um, and I'm Letitia Tunbridge. So I'm just going to hand you over to Katie now, who's going to introduce herself. And uh, yes, Katie Gearing. Hi, I'm Katie. When I'm not writing poetry, you can often find me procrastinating by trying to do embroidery and often pricking my fingers at the time. Lovely, Katie. Thank you. And Next up, I'd like to introduce Michelle Mother Hubbard, known to many of you, I'm sure. Good evening. Uh, yes, Michelle Mother Hubbard, um, poet, storyteller, African drummer, um, try it photographer, try it artist, drawer, sketcher, love gardening, grandchildren, grandmother to six. So no free time for anything else. It's a busy life you got there, Michelle. Too busy. <laughs> And poetry as well, fabulous. <laughs> okay, and our musician this evening is Mr. Paul Carbuncle. Hello, yes. Um, when I'm not twanging strings and writing songs and making lovely things like old fashioned CDs, I accidentally write poetry, apparently. You do, you do indeed. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, so what's gonna happen this evening? It's not just going to be a dull old boring read around poetry event thing. No, 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 no. We're going to do a game of consequences, also known as Paul. The Exquisite Corpse. The Exquisite Corpse, that's it. 
but you might know it as consequences. You know when somebody writes a few lines of, on a piece of paper, folds it over and passes it on? Well, we're going to be doing a poetry music version of that. So uh, I'm going to kick off because I can. And then we're going to take it, we're going to put a hat, take it in turns to respond with whatever poem or piece of music comes to mind from the piece before. Okay, so I'll kick off with a poem called Poetry Virus. Uh, I wrote this following a, a Zoom event with a poet up in Scarborough. Um, this is what happened. The poet wrote his poems and then he went to read them. The country was in lockdown so down the Zoom he'd feed them. But his microphone was a critic. It didn't want to share. Whenever he read a poem aloud, it was distorted to the crowd. It had the poetry virus. It hated rhyming schemes. Every time he read one sound distorted at the seams. It let him chat for hours. No interference there. As soon as the meter kicked in, the virus would appear. It was the poetry virus. It hated rhyming schemes. Every time he read one, it was distorted at the seams. It let him chat for hours, no interference there. As soon as the meter kicked in, the virus would appear. They tried to adjust the mic, they tried altering the sound, they tried reading standing up or even lying down. But it was the poetry virus, it hated rhyming schemes. Every time he read one, sound distorted at the seams. They altered the type of recording, they changed the order of poem. But every time he started one, distortion kicked in. It was the poetry virus. It hated rhyming schemes. Every time he read one, sound distorted at the seams. Graham was at the end of his tether. He'd done a lot of gigs, up and down the country with punks and poets and kids. Bad reviews are one thing, you get them now and then. But the microphone was the critic and it really wouldn't let him in. It had the poetry virus, it hated rhyming schemes. Every time he read one sound distorted at the seams. Thank you. So I'm going to hand you over to... Okay, Michelle. Poetry. Virus one thing that connects us looking forwards not backwards in a room full of strangers it's the poetry that connects us these zoom nights connect us all right and we shine like a bright light we need each other creatively speaking we're sister and brother your electrical energy activates this invisible microphone we're zoom poetry zoomers out here not alone. Outsiders don't understand us, but together, we're never alone. We've shared more with each other tonight than we'd share if we went on a date. The trust and the sharing that poetry brings is intimate, wonderful, great. And now we don't even need to drive home. We sit here with verse in our head, and I'll sleep, then I'll write, then I'll sleep some more and I'll sit on the edge of my bed. I know that your voice and your verses inspire, and we go away buzzing with a belly full of fire, and I'll yearn for the next time that we find this connection, because our poetry provides the perfect meditation. Thanks, Michelle. So, Paul. Oh, Katie, Katie. I said I've got a couple about uh, about lockdown, but not about po poetry in lockdown. It's a connection, Katie. Yeah. Sounds good. Best of eight, part two. The chirping birds are even louder now, singing lullabies to babies just born, hopping from tree to tree with worms in their beaks. A gust of wind shakes the nearby branches, and blossom falls like a broken piñata. I pick pink petals out of my hair and I'm grateful for this time. 
balmy evenings with pastel sunsets, discovering streets a stone's throw away, rainbows adorning windows and daffodils brightening up empty pathways. Have the birds always sung this much? I'm used to the steady drone of cars constantly by my window, the beep of the pedestrian crossing and the laughter of passing groups. I prefer the bird song. I've always wondered how it'd feel to hibernate, but in my visions, it'd be winter. The cold mornings breathing frost on the glass, watery sunlight breaking through the gray clouds after too long a slumber, and I'd be grateful, smug, watching bundled up coats and scarves traversing icy paths as I lay under a blanket and snooze like a cat. I didn't expect it to be like this, a universal pause, estivating whilst the world keeps on turning. The trees are growing verdant, ducklings are hatching from eggs, foxes are free to roam at night and inside we stop. That was great. Anybody pick up a line there, Paul? Birds, trees, cherries. Land of ungratefulness, land of misrule, whose voices resentment, whose actions are cruel, whose policy is to traumatise, whose enemy is hope. It's a hostile environment and a slippery slope. Kamal dreams of living in his daddy's house in Brum, but he's locked up in Yarlswood with his sister and mum. Oh, we recognise it's desirable to reunite kith and kin, but it's a hostile environment and you ain't coming in. Nicolette has run her cafe since 1994. Now if she can't find a pile of paperwork, they'll show her the door. Yeah, we know you paid your tax all these 25 years. But it's a hostile environment, so what's with the tears? Cherry last saw Trinidad when she was just five. In her seventies now she sees a prison van arrive. As you appear to have no passport, let us make you aware that it's a hostile environment and your home is back there. Land of ungratefulness, land of misrule, whose voice is resentment, whose actions are cruel. Whose policy is to traumatise, whose enemy is hope. It's a hostile environment and a slippery slope. Thanks, Paul. Hostile environment. It's um, almost as if this government doesn't know what they're doing, isn't it? As if, as if. On the other hand, um, on the other hand, we have had confirmation of uncertainty. It's official. We've had the email. The score confirms we are definitely in a period of uncertainty. It's official. We've had the email. The boss confirms our job security is definitely an uncertainty. It's official. We've had the email. The city confirms it awaits advice defiantly in uncertainty. It's official. We've had the email. The government is still in charge. We are certainly in a period of indefinacy. Thank you. Michelle, over to Michelle. Speaking of politics, 
as I don't like to. It makes my blood boil. I certainly wouldn't be voting for any of the lot we've got at the moment, but please don't vote for me. I turn poet because I ain't a politician. See, there's things I need to shout about and I won't wait for permission. You will not give me airtime, I don't need your transmission. I'll tell it how it is and won't be silenced into submission. I don't need party political quotes. I'm not here to gain extra votes. My pen defends each sentence that I ever wrote. I write poetry, not referendum. If MPs try to follow me, I'll quickly unfriend them. Ask me any question, I'll answer it fairly. And I'll speak loud and I'll speak clearly. And those at the back, well, just check in. Can you hear me? I'm not here to baffle you, don't want to confuse you. There won't be a selfie of me trying to abuse you. If I was a politician, would I mix the truth with lies? Would I deny permission to the yearning in your eyes? Would I walk all over my mother and never apologise? Eat the bread of wickedness while she eats humble pies? Would I hold an offshore bank account? Of which I would deny. Carry a tashi, suitcase, briefcase, dressed in suit and tie. No, I'll be a poetess and dress the way I want to dress. I will not ask you to place an X in any silly popularity contest. No. So, I'll just refuse any manifesto that tries to prioritise politics before poetics. Great, Michelle. Thanks. Anybody got a link to that? Go on, Paul. Go, Paul. Go, Paul. Yeah. Tell us your link as well. I'll get, I'll get my little bit of politics out of the way as well. No politician either, but a, a little comment, mostly about the newspapers. This is called Their Front Pages. What's the latest front page lie? What packs a tabloid punch? 700,000 foreign kids are claiming free school lunch. They'll demonise the weak and poor. There's no empathy, there's no shame. Cause when they call this austerity, it's a coal by another name. Let's have Meghan Markle and Harry stories from your wretched servile hacks. And never mind the food banks, never mind the bedroom tax. They'll means test this, they'll means test that, and then reject your claim. And when they call this austerity, it's a cull by another name. Give us Royal Britannia headlines. Then call us lazy shirkers Blame Europe, blame the unions Let's blame the migrant workers Make the old and sick jump through endless hoops In a hopeless twisted game Cause when they call this austerity It's a cull by another name And when they call this austerity It's a cull by another name Excellent. Keeping Excellent. it cheery. That put me in mind of my poem Lifelines, so I will read that one now. Some rivers don't run to the Great Lakes, the reservoirs or the sea. We all hear the trickle of the young, the babble of the shallows, the roar of the rapids and the whoosh of the deeps as they journey to their destinations. But some rivers don't run to the great lakes, the reservoirs, or the seas. Some become quieted. They sink from sight, pushed by boulders into deep silence. Run crazed between strata of molten lava, forced into cracks, divided, frozen, damned. Some rivers don't make it to the great lakes, to the reservoirs, or to the seas. Thank you.
talking of the sea, I am um, I grew up next door to a beach, so I find that the sea and the ocean is in my poetry a lot because I'm so landlocked here in Nottingham that I can't help but think about it sometimes. So this one is called Sea Legs. The sea calls to me sometimes, the tide drawing me in, a conch shell to my ear, I hear the whispering coercion. Come home, come home, come home. I could, I could get on a train, be there for nightfall, watch the sun kiss the sea goodnight, watch the moon stretch and begin her day as I end mine. I could be new again. I could start walking, feel the water kiss my ankles, my thighs, my neck, allow it to kiss me everywhere, all at once. Slowly, slowly, I could change. I could become baptised by sirens, come out stronger, come out singing. I could let the water take over, let the algae become matted with my hair, let my feet change to tail and my skin to scales. I could open my eyes underwater. This isn't so bad. This could be peaceful. They'd find me hair splayed, eyes shut, moon pale. Or I could dip my feet in the water, shudder at how cold it is and run away. Look back, contemplate and carry on. Not today. Excellent. There's loads of connections. Okay. Okay. I love that one about the ocean. And um, it made me think of the things that we couldn't foresee. I haven't been abroad for years and uh, wanted to go to Corfu this year. And obviously this time last year, we had no idea that that couldn't happen. And that reminds me of a time before when I'd been to Corfu, when the, um, the electrics went out because of a storm and I sat in the room watching out across the sea, we were very close to the sea at this most amazing storm, uh, which brings me to this one called Storm Clouds Are Raging. Turbulence is gathering, there's going to be a storm. Ignorant, cold meets hot, angry air. Agitation brewing, times are raging. Restlessness is visible. Caution was thrown to the wind and now whips back in a tornado of emotion. Disturbance is forecast, but havoc is predicted. Black storm clouds gather, a rumble with anger. Hot meets cold and it causes a clash. An almighty clap, a lightning flash, thrown into turmoil. A commotion on a grand scale. What a hurly-burly. Fooled by the calm before the storm, this mutiny is bound to run its course. Excellent. Who wants to jump in? Paul, I know you've got one that I would do if I were you. Uh, you're going to have to help me again. <laughs> Might slow. have an onion in it. It's got an onion in it. I was waiting for Katie's onion. Yeah, but you can lead to her onion. I can lead to her. Oh, of course. <laughs> She's good at this. But Michelle was talking about, you know, the calm before the storm and yours is the after. Yeah. Yeah. Right then. Calm before the storm. Let these lyrics speak for themselves, I hope. Chopping an onion. Chopping an onion, an onion she'd grown in the vegetable patch she dug in her lawn. She glanced out the window and then looked again as the telegram boy turned into the light. She 
shamefully wished the young angel of death upon innocent neighbours under her breath. Then her heart split apart and a single tear fell as he walked up the path and rang on the bell. He stood in his navy blue jacket and hat and held out the envelope, eyes on the mat. She opened it painfully, thank you, she said. Regret to inform was as far as she read. Rereading the words as she sits on the stair with a cold cup of tea and a howl of despair. It's been 17 hours and she can't understand how her son came to vanish in some distant land. It's been 17 weeks and she wishes she knew if he suffered, how he suffered, where he suffered and with who. Then comes a letter describing her grave. Says she ought to feel proud He was strong, he was brave It's been 17 years and she's never known Why her boy had to go, why he didn't come home She's still growing veg and she's still baking pies And when she chops onions No one asks why she cries There are many different types of onions. There are also many different types of creativity that mention onions. Some songs, some poems. So this one doesn't actually have a title because I tend to write my poems and then think of titles. And sometimes I just sit there for ages and I just don't think of titles. So this is another titleless poem of mine. I spent hours threading this needle, all fingers and thumbs, too frenetic. Try to silence a black dog barking in my peripheries and try to remember childhood sewing lessons. Seven years old, scraped knees and gloomless. I wish to be like this again, wish to be like I portray myself, scatty and clumsy and unafraid of what's new. Lying to myself, lying in the way new lovers do, undressing layers like onion peel, spilling secrets in the dark. Spooning with your front curled into my back like a question mark, the palm of your hand resting on my thigh, coaxing out each hateful thought of mine without even trying, with, no, with trust no other person has tried to earn. Soothing the black dog, soothing my restless limbs, kissing the punctures on my fingers from the slip of my hands, and reassuring me I am fine just as I am. Thank you. That put me in mind of um, a little snapshot poem I've done during lockdown. So there's two little snapshots. One's of the 16th of April and the other is the 19th of May. So April 16th, 2020. The broken pot, the crying cat, the homegrown crops, the dishevelled bed, the magnification of shadows, sounds of circular sores, the half-seen thing in the mirror. A distant car toots its horn, a dog growls, a row brews, the pages turn unaided. May 15th, nope, May 19th, 2020. May has been beautiful. The sun has shone gloriously, the birds twittered, the flowers bloomed, and I felt peaceful, alone. Thank you.
Michelle, okay. This is called Just Looking and thinking of the things that we saw home there back in April, things that we happened then that we couldn't have foreseen now and how we look backwards and we look forwards. Just looking, running wayward, looking backwards. Centuries weave raindrops through my long forgotten dreadlocks. Persuasive as ever, I admit it, you're clever as you access my emotions once more and tears trickle down to the floor. Boundaries surround me, I'm glad that you found me just in the nick of time or I might have got nicked for a crime I'd already conceived in my mind. Umbilical connections define our relation so even when I go undercover I always look just like my mother. Your lines run across my palm, the sound of your heartbeat makes me feel calm. My forefathers smile from your eyes, shining like stars in ancestral skies. I'm pretty sure we've met before like a distant sea to a distant shore, but we're face down, face down, face down, drowning in uptown clowning and people are surrounding to get a closer look. Are you buying this book? If not, put it down and move on. You crease in the pages and steal in the wagers till the hopes of a poet are gone. So press mute on your Zoom record. Don't record this one. But we did, and I think Paul's got one to go. Well, go, go, go. If I, if I can, if I can be self-indulgent and just look back as far as I can look back, I've got one. My earliest memory, which is as much smell as anything visual. Um, is of the hop gardens of Kent and picking hops with my mum and my nan. Here's a little bit of nonsense accordingly. Now dear old mother nincompoop had nigh twelve month been dead. She heard the hops were pretty good and she just popped out her head. And it's our lousy hops, pick them up all off the ground. Our lousy hops, we pick them up when the measurer he comes round. Now some of us are pluckly born and some are from the shires and one or two a gravel walk with woodbines and guitars and it's our lousy ops pick em up all off the ground our lousy ops we pick em up when the measurer he comes round now twelve o'clock it's dinner time down in the up we go there's apples off the orchard and there's cob nuts off the row and it's our lousy ops pick em up all off the ground our lousy ops we pick em up when the measurer he comes round now half the time we're mucky mitts and half the time half clean then it's mostly we're kept waiting till the measurers come and been and it's our lousy ops pick em up all off the ground our lousy ops we pick em up when the measurer he comes round now when he comes to measure he never knows where to stop why don't he just get in the bin and take the sodding lot and it's our lousy ops pick em up all off the ground our lousy ops we pick em up when the measurer he comes round yeah and that's that nice one paul okay i have a poem about memories i don't know if that would that would probably fit quite well wouldn't it yeah and it mentions acorns excellent <laughs> memories are funny things aren't they i suppose i don't i well i do i write about my memories quite a lot but this next poem talks about memories so uh, quite long reaching I suppose. It is aptly called Memories. The acorns were fast, brass shining in morning sun, bulbs worn smooth by frantic fingers lying forgotten on an old desk in a room I could no longer bring to mind. Three sisters next, Orion's belt sparkling in ink sky, invisible tethers connecting loop to buckle, 
standing out even in streetlight, just voices on the wind keeping me safe and showing me the way home. The smell of an old book transports me back, spine crackling like coal on a barbecue as my nose is filled with a thousand stories waiting to greet me. I wonder how many memories jostle for space in my brain, push themselves to the forefront just once before bowing out, making room for new ones I haven't experienced yet. Great. I've got one. I've got one. Can I go? See, that made me think of this poem. Um, talking of memories and things you haven't experienced yet. And this poem is called And Yet. She dreams of expansive blue skies. He dreams of fields of grasses waving. She dreams of fresh, crispy air. And he dreams of unrestricted motion. She dreams of space to fully stretch. He dreams of wildly leaping, yet they are together in this place. This flat with four little rooms. They have to share the bathroom space. They have to share the kitchen. They want to share the bedroom space. This leaves just one room, yet they can't imagine not being together. They can't imagine being apart. They can't imagine staying in forever. They can't imagine going out. They can't imagine how this will end. Yet he dreams of splashing in rivers with her. She dreams of walking miles with him. He dreams of leaping boulders with her and she dreams of skipping stones with him. They dream of days when this is over, yet they are together in this place, this flat with four little rooms. They have to share the bathroom space. They have to share the kitchen. They want to share the bedroom space. This leaves just one room. Yet this room, despite the zooms it holds, despite the work piles mess, this room despite the we in the corner, this room despite the view to the west, holds treasure precious in a jar. Yet in 2020, all through the weeks of lockdown and pandemic chaos, of smelly socks and PMS rages, of eating too much and too much drinking. All the time they are thinking what endearments to speak on paper, wishes and promises for the future. Yet here they are, confined inside four small rooms for months on end, just the two of them together dreaming of stretching, of leaping, of space, planning their forever plans, only going out for essentials. Not once did they expect the sickness would affect them, and yet Thank you. Anybody have a... Go Paul, I can see it working in your head there. Oh, yeah, uh, it's, it's not a great connection, but it does start in a living room. <laughs> Excellent, that sounds like it. I have a song that starts in a living room. I suppose you wouldn't know it, except there's a telly in it. Um, and this is a song about my granddad William Cullen. Uh, it's called Dublin Bill and it starts yeah, in the front room in Walreeds Avenue in South Ashford. He says, woman, turn that racket off. So she puts down her tea. 
She shuffles across the living room and she turns down the TV. He waits until she's settled back and got comfy with a tray in her lap. Then he glances up and as she lifts her cup he says, That's not off, that's down. That's not off, that's down. <laughs> Begin back in County Kildare, Dublin Bill, would it be fair to say you weren't a one for school? All your bridges swiftly burnt and your letters left unlearned just to tear away, but you could charm them all, nobody's fool. Sooner use your wits than follow any rule. Whoa, 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 I, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. You took a girl for a romp in the hay Dublin Bill at the farm down the line in a shed Found some guns in the straw, told your dad what you saw Breathe one word of this and we'll all be dead Father said, here's a clip round the ear, now off to bed Whoa, 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 I, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa the next morning you put on the boat, Dublin Bill bound for London to live with Auntie Mai. When you find out she ain't real, you don't know what to think or feel, then two ladies of the night kindly say it's okay. If you want, you're welcome to stay. Whoa, 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 aye, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. And they taught you to read and to write, Dublin Bill slowly taught you to write and to read. Then the press gang it down, going the streets all around, they said, Paddy boy, you're just the kind we need. Yes indeed, you'd be better off in khaki than in tweed. Whoa, 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 aye, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. It's the bomb disposal unit for you, Dublin Bill. Bomb disposal will suit your steely eye. Soon you're shaken to the core, can't do the job no more. When you see your new best mate blow sky eye, God you cry, Jesus Christ, there ain't no bleeding way to die. Whoa, 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 aye, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. Now you're settled down in Ashford, so it seems Dublin Bill and showing films at the flea pit keeps you calm. You wedge your chisly girl, but one young Patrick, one young Pearl, but you're a tear away. So now you're winning charm, or is it snarm? Don't be long at home, but down the Denmark arms. Whoa, 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 I, 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 whoa, whoa. down at the Denmark Arms. Not that I drink, but it would be nice to think that we're free to go and do what we like and drink where we like and drink what we like instead of having to bottle it all up. My life is on the rocks, shaken, not stirred. I've been thinking about taking up drinking. Tired of bottling things up, I need to find a release. Do I make myself clear? I'm pouring my heart out here. I'm sick of being hung over a barrel. I've been clearing out my cellar to make way for the future. There's a crate full of happiness just around the corner. 50 something was supposed to be the happy hour. Life's elixir soon turned sour. Then somebody shouted last orders and I'd only just walked through the door. My glass got knocked onto the floor and shattered. But there's no use crying over a spilt pint, I know. But there was more in that glass than just a pint. It was my future. You tried to convince me my glass was half empty, but life always taught me to think positively. So I saw that glass as half full. Still, life is full of hiccups. I won't get dizzy with worry. I'm going to slip through life. I ain't in a hurry. Life sweetens naturally with time, like a bottle of vintage wine. Unfortunately, I can't find a corkscrew. 
and the whole bloody country's on lockdown. That was great, Michelle. Oh. Has anybody got something they want to come in with, Katie? I think none of us expected 2020 to, like, to go the way it has gone. And looking back at last year and how different it was and how weird this year has been in comparison. So this one is called Winter Returns. Whipped cream clouds whisper across the sky, the afternoon light paling as the hours pass in anticipation of a watery sunset. Winter isn't here yet, but the bite of the wind on our reddening cheeks reminds us to look for long forgotten coats and scarves abandoned on hooks before all this began, when the year was still in its infancy and our New Year's revolutions were still fresh on our tongues. I plunge my hand into my faithful coat's deep pockets and curl my fingers around decaying paper receipts, ink faded at its crisp folds but clear underneath. Bills for restaurants and museums enjoyed, recalling hugs punctuated with fragrant hair, sharing food, holding hands and walking close enough to bump shoulders. I miss the firmness of my loved one's arms around me, kissing on cheeks and the reassuring squeeze of a hand that tells me it'll be okay. I wish, as with all things, that I'd taken it in a bit more remembered each touch and held on for a few more seconds and as I coax out these memories of warmth I fold the receipt again and I place it safe not in the bin but back in its pocket. How it was last year was quite different I have to agree Katie it couldn't have been more different to be honest. So I, I, think, I think it's important that we do something that, that we enjoy, something that makes us happy. So I've written a little guide called How to Dance Alone. I was going to stand up and do this, but if I stand up and do this, all the wires will come out and it'll all go horribly wrong. So you'll just have to dance with me. Listen to the rhythm, nod the bass, feel the beat. Show it with your backbone, extend left, bend it right. Shoulders dip with rhyme, rise in time, drop and roll. Catch apples with your arms. Float them out and let them go. Relax, no one's watching. Free your feet, let them bounce. Circle your hips round again, other way now bend. And dip and repeat. Listen to the rhythm, nod the bass, feel the beat. Show it with your backbone, extend left, bend it right. Shoulders dip with rhyme, drop and roll, rise in time, catch apples with your hands. Float them out and let them go. Relax, no one's watching. Free your feet, let them bounce, circle out your hips. Other way. Now bend and dip and repeat and let that smile in your heart curl your lips. You're dancing. Thank you. Hope you enjoy the little dance. Okay, if you'd all like to unmute yourselves for a moment. You're sure no one's watching, aren't you? I don't care. <laughs> I really don't care if anyone's watching or not, to be honest. <laughs> I would just like to say a really big thank you. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed watching this. It's been a a journey where we've gone from, we've gone back to the hot picking in Kent. We've been off to the seaside with Katie. We've talked about emigration and immigration and what it's like to feel like you're not heard and to shout up saying that you want to be heard. We've been dancing. We've done all sorts. We've done all sorts today. It's amazing. And it's isn't it interesting how we all came with a set of poems or songs and there was a connection. There was always a connection, whether it was an onion peel or a bird in a tree or or what it was, there was a connection. Because we are connected. We're striving striving to stay connected and enjoy it. 
So I would just like to give my thanks to uh, Michelle Mother Hubbard. A big round of applause. Thank you. You can catch Michelle at Blackdrop and you can look out for her. Do you have a website, Michelle? Uh, no, so I've okay. got <laughs> But if you find Blackdrop on Instagram, we have some Zoom drop events coming up. Excellent. Let's keep an eye out for them. We'll put a load of links at the end anyway. And uh, Katie Gearing, thank you very much. Katie generally hosts Ludorati, but obviously with lockdown, that's not been happening. Have you been doing any Zoom events, Katie? We did do some Zoom events. We um we took a break for summer, and um, we're taking a long summer break. So maybe that will start off again soon. Um, if you uh, look at Nottingham Writers Collective on Facebook or Meetup. You can find the groups there and we'll put an update in when we start doing our writing groups again. Brilliant, thank you. And we've got Paul Carbuncle. Thank you very much. Now Paul I know has things on Bandcamp on his website. Quote it out like that. Oh, he's good isn't he? Because I couldn't remember what order it comes. Your name then Bandcamp apparently. Yes. You can even get a t-shirt now. The future's here. It's just boring. And your new CD is called? Monkfish Mix-Up at Farmer's Market, obviously. Obviously. Let's check, yes. It's all right. It's good. Yeah. It's <laughs> very good. My name's Letitia Tunbridge. I perform my poetry in various places and I have a few books out. You can find these on the letitiapoet.com website but here we are every last biscuit world jam anthology a backpack on his backpack all in a different order um, and I'm I'm the host of Poetry Aloud Presents so look out for us online and everywhere and big thanks to uh, Keith Turner as well for putting this together and doing all the hard work if you saw the pickle that we all got in recording this <laughs> <laughs> you'd realize what a hard hard job Keith has had to do to come up with this at the end of it so thank you very much to Keith um, yes and thank you very much audience for joining us into Nottingham Poetry Festival for putting us out to you okay so thank you Paul Katie Michelle Keith for teching and you all for joining us and I'm Letitia good night fight with a dwarf. Whatever you do, don't pick a fight with Geoffrey Hudson. He'll kill you. Geoffrey Hudson was a perfectly proportioned dwarf in the court of Queen Henrietta Maria back in the 17th century. For those of you who aren't aware, Queen Henrietta Maria was the wife of Charles I, the King of England, the Civil War King. I don't know what it was about monarchs and dwarves in early modern Europe, but kings and queens couldn't get enough of them. Mary I had one, Edward VI had one, as did Queen Anne and George III, and that was just the kings and queens of England. European monarchs were even worse. Queen Henrietta Maria was French. She had three dwarves. One of them was Geoffrey Hudson. He was the one you didn't want to pick a fight with. I suppose being a dwarf by royal appointment was a big deal back then if you were a dwarf in an extended age of heightened superstition and ridicule. But in order to become a dwarf by royal appointment, you had to shake hands with the devil. When Geoffrey Hudson was seven years old, his parents gave him to the Duke of Buckingham. The Duke of Buckingham made a present of Geoffrey Hudson to Queen Henrietta Maria. 
Geoffrey Hudson was placed in a pie, a pie, and presented to Queen Henrietta Maria. Geoffrey Hudson erupted from the pie, scattering flakes of pastry, like those four and twenty blackbirds they used to sing about in children's stories. The Queen was awfully amused. Geoffrey Hudson was in. He took his place at the court of Queen Henrietta Maria alongside a giant, a court monkey named Pug, several Roman Catholic priests and the two other dwarves I mentioned earlier. He was given the title Lord Minimus. He had his picture painted by Van Dyck and was trotted out on occasion to perform in court masks designed by none other than Inigo Jones. Admittedly, this sort of thing didn't happen every day. Mostly his duties were to stand there and be stared at or commented upon, or laughed at. Geoffrey Hudson was a roaring success, but all that buried anger has to go somewhere, doesn't it? Geoffrey Hudson served his queen faithfully for 19 years. He served her during the years of peace. He served her throughout the years of civil conflict. He served her during an exile in France. Then something quietly snapped inside Geoffrey Hudson and he decided that he didn't want to be ridiculed anymore. He even made a public statement to that effect. An English cavalier laughed at him. Geoffrey Hudson challenged him to a duel. I mean, the Cavalier found this all awfully amusing and turned up to the duel with a water pistol. Geoffrey Hudson arrived with a real pistol and shot him in the head and blew his head clean off. You don't mess with Geoffrey Hudson. Thank you to all of the poets from our first half. We can't wait to show you what else we've got lined up for you this afternoon. But first, I just want to tell you about the Nottingham Poetry Hunt. So, basically, all around the city, there are venues that have got poems stashed in their windows and on their social media feeds. If you head over to our website, you'll find a treasure map. Use the treasure map to find those poems and write your creative responses and submit them at the Nottingham Poetry Festival website. We've got some wicked prizes on offer. We've got a creative short course from NTU, a mystery box of books from Five Leaves, just all sorts. So get involved and head over to the website to find out more. Next up this afternoon, we have got Maria Taylor, Sunita Thind, a collaboration between Poets Against Racism and Resistance Live, and all the way from Australia, we have got Mr. Rosley, a.k.a. Father Farmyard. See you after. Hiya, my name is Maria Taylor, and I recently had a book out um, in September called Dressing for the Afterlife. So in order to try and explain what dressing for the afterlife is, um, I try and do that in the prologue of the book. To dress for the afterlife, step into the precise moment you ended a former existence and zip yourself into the unknown. Choose a wedding outfit, a pair of overalls, an invisibility cloak, or the dress of a country you have never visited before. This is how you must learn to breathe again. Now, Obviously 2020 didn't go quite the way some of us thought it would. So in this next poem, I'm trying to imagine a version of the 2020s, which is more like the 1920s, in which I am a silent film goddess, because why not? I began the 2020s as a silent film goddess. On the 1st of January, I threw away my smartphone and wrote a letter to my bow in swirling ink. I bobbed my hair, wore a cloche hat and shimmied right into town for juleps. I became Clara, I became Louise. When I became a vamp, the boys fell dead at my feet. I threw petals over their heads. I dined on prosperity sandwiches and sidecars, leaving restaurants with a sugar-rimmed mouth. In summer, I was a night-blooming flower. By autumn, I was a hangover. Winter made me a Wall Street crash. Talking pictures were my ruin. At last, I had a voice, but no one wanted to hear. Forgotten sisters, O oh Vilma, O oh Norma, O oh May, a musty headdress of peacock feathers, defiant silence. So, um, 
I am a runner, which is hard for me to believe because I only took up running when I was 40. So this is a poem about that. She ran. I took up running when I was 40. I opened my front door and started running down a filthy jitty and past my parents' flat. I ran through every town in which I'd ever lived. I ran past all my exes, even a few crushes who sipped mochas and wore dark glasses. I ran in a wedding dress through scattered confetti and was cheered by the cast of Star Wars. I ran through the screaming wind, rain and cloud. I ran through my mother's village and flew past armed soldiers at the checkpoint. I ran past my grandparents and Bapusi's mangy goats with their mad eyes and scaled yellow teeth. I ran straight through Oxford and Cambridge, didn't stop. I saw a naked man in Piccadilly Gardens. I ran through high school and behind the gym where goffy teens smoked and necked each other. I passed an anxious mother pushing a pram and a baby that kept throwing out her doll. Seasons changed, summer turned into autumn. I couldn't get as far as I wanted. The lights changed, my ribs, my flaming heart and my tired, tired body burned. Um, so after that, I think it's time we all had a break by going to the pub. So I know at the moment we can't go to the pub and that's kind of been a 2020 thing as well. So um, I'm going to spend Friday at the moon. You're probably right. I look the type who drinks vanilla, vanilla lattes, but there I was with a shot of something devastating. And yes, I did entertain the regulars with my slurred cursive eloquence. I probably sang, I probably chased a man with a red rose between my teeth. I tiptoed past a stone couple who never talked to each other. I tottered by Prosecco fluted hens, saluted the old boy in last season's mildew, the Adidas man who speaks to his hands. I saw pale ale ghosts, lonely hearts, golf kitted students necking snake bite on a crawl they won't remember. No idea how I got back, but if you said I floated home on a magic carpet, who'd doubt it? I fell in, I felt enchanted. Did I look happy to you? So this next poem is a little bit embarrassing. It's one of those poems that is hard to tell your mum that you wrote it. Um, so <laughs> it, it was actually in an anthology called The Poetry Set which was published by Penguin. And um, I just was imagining, just completely imagining a hypothetical situation with Daniel Craig, hypothetical. A friend of mine asks me if I'd sleep with Daniel Craig. Before I have time to answer, I'm in bed with Daniel Craig. He's stirring out of sleep, smelling of tobacco vanille. He flatters my performance, asks if I'd like coffee. Hang on, I say, I did not sleep with you, Daniel Craig. This is just a conversational frolic. My friend stands in the corner of my bedroom. You've gone too far, she says. I'm pulling the duvet away from his Hollywood body at exactly the moment my husband enters the room. I say, yes, this is exactly what it looks like, darling, but it's hypothetical, a mere conversational frolic. He's threatening me. There are lawyers in the room. My children begin to cry. I don't even like Daniel Craig. It's too late. The sheets are full of secreted evidence. There are forensics in the room covering my body in blue powder, checking my skin for fingerprints. They match Daniel Craig's. He doesn't even know he's slept with me. My marriage is a dead goal. My neighbours come into the room shaking heads. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. My husband has drawn lists of all the things he wants to keep. A plasma screen, an Xbox, a collection of muesli coloured pebbles from our holidays in Truro. When you zuffed me, he snaps. My children will see a therapist after school. Daniel Craig is naked in a hypothetical sense, telling me we can make this work. My friend smirks behind a celebrity magazine featuring lurid details of our affair. There are photos. We are on a beach in the Dominican Republic, healthy and tanned, both kicking sand at a playful Joan Collins. I don't even like Daniel Craig, I tell the ceiling. So after that, things get a bit ghostly. Um, I go underground. Now this poem is actually about um, an underground station, Covent Garden, 
where apparently for many years people said it was haunted by the ghost of an actor called Will Terrell. And apparently no one sees him anymore, but um, that's where the poem starts from, ghosting. Think of Will, the ghost of Covent Garden, the murdered fesp who's walking alongside you down and down a staircase that never ends. Dapper gent, eventually you'll see daylight, the actor won't. Spare a thought for the ghosts we pass at stations, their secret meetings, flings, kisses. People vanish into thin air every single day, even ghosts fade in time. Where do they go, all those see-through Elizabethans? Plantagenet kings in car parks, crying boys reaching out for our faces, those we can't see, can't feel. You're no different. Look, here's your own reflection. So, after ghosts and Daniel Craig, I think it's only fair we'd had a bit of praying. Uh, I think we need God right now. So, um, this poem's actually about a little chapel in my dad's village in Cyprus. And um, there is an icon in there, which when I saw it, reminded me so much of the gay, urbane um, New York poet, Frank O'Hara, which was probably inappropriate in a church. But he did remind me. So... Then I reconsidered prayer. It was unlike me, light years since my giddy eleison or the cross performed with three digits over skull, stomach and shoulders. In summer, I went back to the chapel in my father's austere village, thinking it was ironic that St. Minas resembled Frank O'Hara so perfectly. I lit Frank a candle and prayed at an altar of two-headed golden eagles to Our Lady of Infinite Hangovers, to the patron saint of Citalopram and the holy trinity of vodka, ageing and insomnia. When the young priest entered, he was so kind that I almost thought it was okay to be me. If I kept quiet, I could be part of the stone. Once a drunk in a dingy Soho pub mistook the moon I keep on a silver chain around my neck for St Christopher. I told God about it. I lit another flame for those who journey alone for the penitent and for the lost. So moving on now, um, I did write a poem um, about my grandpa, who I never met because he died in 1952 in his 40s. And he was always a bit of a fairy tale to me. He was a bit of a legendary figure. Um, so when my grandpa was alive, obviously my family were living in Cyprus at the time. And at that point, it was a, a British colony. So this is me um, as a child, perhaps, finding out about my grandpa and that side of mysterious side of my family. But um, one of the places my parents used to take me was a local bowls pavilion in the park and they'd sit down and they'd witter on. So it's very much that kind of afternoon, perhaps in the past, outside the bowls pavilion. The pavilion. Under the pavilion's eaves, the year 1930 is carved. They took pride in things when we had an empire, one man's keen to tell me. Not that he would remember, the empire has fallen like rotten teeth. In that year, Vapir would have been 25 with less than twice that to live. How neat this building is, how it reminds us of order and symmetry. Vapu would have known the same flag. Men dressed in shrill whites play bowls. One bowl bumps politely into another, a soft ceramic chink as if to say, excuse me. His manners are rewarded with a round of applause. When Bapu died, he was 47. No photographs, no letters. He was handed down to me like a fairy tale, with no happy ending for his widow. He'd had a stroke. The village had no doctors. Yea, I rounded up chaos like a sheepdog and raised six children. No time for pride. Tea time. The players head into the pavilion. I stay outside. And one day I became a mother and um, I had to read all those silly books which tell you how to be the perfect mummy. And um, this is my contribution to that genre. Um, it's written from the point of view of a wonderfully perfect mummy who is telling you everything you need to know about why she is so marvellous, as opposed to the rest of us who are kind of muddling through most of the time poem in which I live motherhood. I have several children, 
all perfect, with tongues made of soap and PVA glue running through their veins. My boys and girls benefit from eating the rainbow. I iron children twice daily. Creases are the devil's hoofprint. I am constructed from sticky back tape, pipe cleaners and clothes pegs. There are instructions for making me. Look at the appropriate shelves in reputable stores. I am fascinated by bunk beds, head lice and cupcakes. You will only leave the table when I have given you clear instructions. So far, I have not. The schoolroom is my red carpet. Yes, you're right. How do I manage it? Though I didn't ask you. Dreaming is permitted from 7.40 to 8.20 a.m. on Saturdays and bank holidays. My children's reward charts are full of glittery stars. I am the Milky Way. Crying is dirty. One house point. Two, if you eat up all your peas. I always go off half an hour before my alarm. In the morning, I speak a language of bleeps and bell tones. Chew with your mouth closed. No, don't chew at all. Admire the presentation. Underneath my ribs is a complex weather system of sunshine and showers. Heat rises from me and blows across the Gulf Stream of my carefully controlled temper. Sometimes I am missed. Um, this next poem, I was lucky enough to make it into the forward book of poems for this year. Um, it was highly commended and it's kind of about time travel and back to pubs again. Or because why not? Loop. Maybe time moves like a figure of eight surging forwards and back on itself. Light returns from exploded stars. A grown woman could turn a corner and see herself crying as a girl. News flash, our world ends again. The disappearing forests of childhood disappear again. The path curves. It takes a woman back to a dimly lit bar where she meets the same lover again and again. She risks everything once more. They've already met before they've said a word. And to finish off, I was going to read out another running poem, um, a bit more hopeful than the last one, because I think hope is a very important quality that we all need, especially with the way things are right now. Um, and it's just about the pleasure of running alone and feeling like you're almost flying. Um, it's something that obviously I didn't do until quite late in life. So I'm not the best runner in the world, but um, here's my little poem in praise of my hobby. Woman running alone. A woman who follows her own trail and pounds pavements of unending cities, past statues of forgotten men, fountains, sticky sunshine pouring over tower blocks, past gentrified basement windows where wives hear the washing up howl between their hands past suits on phones and panda-eyed women in doorways with faces that say, I know, I know, tell me about it. These streets where open hands beg for more than is ever offered, where someone's kid is a sleeping bag, where the wolf whistle becomes the wolf and loves worn like musk aftershave, where she forgets who she is, Miss Keep On, Miss Never Going Home, neither running away nor running toward anyone, wind sifted, letting the weather sing through her, she who is different to her brothers. The rhythm fills her with flight and her wings, what wings she has. So thank you very much, everyone. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Um, so that was me, Maria Taylor. Hope you have a lovely rest of evening, week, day, whenever it is that you see this. And um, hopefully we'll meet again soon. Maybe I'll be reading to you in real life too. Okay. Goodbye. Hello, my name is Sunita Thind, published poet, writer, author, and creative workshop facilitator and qualified English teacher. I will be reading some poetry for you today from two of my amazing poetry collections from the from the perspective of a South Asian woman living in Britain between two cultures, Punjabi and British. You can follow me at 
Sunita Thind, dash writer at Facebook, and on Instagram and Twitter at S-U-N-I-T-A-T-H-I-N-D. And you can purchase my first book from www.blackpear.net and my second book from www.wildpressedbooks.com. My first book I will be reading a few poems from is called The Barging Buddhi and Other Poems. Buddhi means elderly lady in Punjabi, which is what I am. I'm a British Punjabi woman. Now, the barging buddy. I used to sink into my buddy's cinnamon and homely bosom. This barging buddy permitted some unwitting pedestrian to pass me on the way to the shops. Made a dal carny, she would utter. I want to eat lentil curry. I toyed with a bright yellow Indian gold chain. A fattening and gilded snake. This barging buddy cut down a five-year-old cherub on a bike on her way to her daughter's house. Do see history, Gaddi? She squawks at me. You will, you will do some ironing. She slathers greasy coconut oil in my inky black plait that she swishes from side to side. This barging buddy railroads a gawkish teenager off her skateboard while sweeping the front pavement, languishing in a salwar kameez, tattooed with vermilion forehead. This barging buddy shoves a mishappen shopper Menabani beanie, she mouth. I want to drink water. This barging buddy places an embellished chinny headscarf on my head as we both proceed to the Godvara, the Sikh temple. Wahi Guruji Kakasa, Wahi Guruji Ki Fateh, she prays, a Sikh prayer. This barging buddy is not so barging, this grandmother of mine. My second poem I'm going to read to you is called Gorping at the Gods of the Godavara. Gorping at the Gods of the Godavara. Guru Nanak, Guru Har Gorbing, Guru Amar Das. Wahi Guru Ji Gagasa, Wahi Guru Ji Ki Fateh. My face will be towards that person who says it first. My back will be towards that person who says it afterwards. I will be in between both of them if both of them say it together hence in order to spread the message of brotherhood dual tone chinni strangles me with customs head must be covered with a scarf for a woman and a turban for a man bare feet in a ceremonial hall cover your legs and arms for modesty one universal creator being the name is truth the creative being personified no fear no hatred image of the undying beyond birth self extent by guru's grace the five gears emblazoned on the brain of a punjabi school student learning the punjabi alphabet Ganga comb for cleanliness, slick with coconut oil that my daddima drags through my hair. Gesh, uncut hair, to symbolise spiritual power, or in my case, waist length knots. Gurban, seek sword for respect and justice. Gara, a steel bangle, or in my case, a gold one. Unity of self and constant learning, which meant for me the learning of cultural and religious restrictions. Gachara, Gachi, shorts for modesty. I hear the Girdan seek religious hymns as my onyx black plait swishes into my dal and olugobi curry. I shovel down three roti into my mouth before being dragged to worship in my itchy lime green and gold salwar kameez. 
Jabad Shach, true in the primal being, true through the ages, the Grunthi, the custodian, seated before the Guru Granth Sahib, the Sikh Bible, silver tip beard of the Granthi, sermonising and praying atop his head is a burnt orange turban and a steel gunda ornament fastened, a circle with three weapons. This is a Sikh military emblem. I have numb buttocks from sitting on the floor for hours of the ceremony hall trying to decipher the exotic prayers. I am only partially bilingual. I hear the vajra and the dhal strike up a kirtan, a spiritual song. I continue to gawp at the gods of the godvala in Bethlehem. Herad subsh, jabaj subsh, ho kisach. True here and now, O Nanak, forever true for me. The next book I will be reading from is The Coconut Girl by myself and you can purchase this book from www.wildpressbooks.com So the first poem I'm going to be reading to you is quite a powerful one. It's called The Coconut Girl. Brown on the outside, white on the inside. Sustia girl, said the coconut girl. Jewel doll in Selwa Kameez. Gemstone bindia targeted on forehead. Gidda, said the coconut girl. All cinnamon legs in a profusion of glittered mini skirts. Gin chaser, whiskey sour. Chip butty, fondled by her gorda white boyfriend. Men of Dika, said the coconut girl. I'm fine. Spangle headscarf gagging her. You are so dark, la. You must lose some weight, la. Do see gali, do see muddy. Did you see her niece? She got into medicine. Chirps from the Banshees, the Undijis, the Mummijis, the Dudimars and the Nanimars. Men and Nam, she said, the coconut girl. Bejeweled Lengar crystallised, hot pink and burnt gold, diamonds in her hair, the perfect bride. Nehi, Nehi, said the coconut girl. Mac facade, rhinestone embellished hot pants, holographic stiletto boots, whiskey breath. Her dad saw her with her white boyfriend. Mute was the con was the coconut girl, manacled to her judah, terraformed to her dika, feasting on a banquet of curries. A Punjabi paradox was our coconut girl. The next poem I'm going to read is called The Same Freedoms as Agora. Down the chippy with sapphire, her boyfriend tongues her with her glitzy miniskirt hoiked up. With regularity, of some of the profane words. Packy, shit face, terrorist, raghead, go home, Packy pussy, let me fuck you, little slave girl. I'm sheltered, not allowed to shave my legs, wax my pubes, flash my brown boobs, have a boyfriend, go out alone, no way. Wear makeup, slut paint, as my mum calls it, or knee length, or cut my knee length hair, smothered by parental jellified bovine eyes, the secret hair, uncut, bushy eyebrows, furry upper lip and yeti legs, curry fingers, onion eyes, eating with our hands like savages, no white boys allowed, segregated from the bloody foreigners with no culture, the fire tongue and bloodshot eyes of my dad, dada, I shave the fuzzy legs with my daddy's razor, tweeze my eyebrows into a solitary arch, a slick of Rimmel Heath Cinema lipstick and Desert Rose Mac blusher. Victory or Victoria's Secrets new panties and bra, that little sequin dress from Miss Selfridge. I think I will go commando tonight before I let Brian fuck me. His little brown slave girl. And the last poem I'm going to read to you is called Scarification. Sorry, yeah. Scarification, threading through boulders, scaffolded in damaged flesh. I have a conscience. Will it do harm? Suckle the disfigurement, deeply facilitated in scarification. Are these natural tattoos expendable? Mutilation of the self is not martyrdom. What is the legacy of these limbs of mine? Glassless skin, scraped and scalpeled, puckered and malformed, burning, razored and knifed. Sparkling are the stitches and sutures sewn into the skin, reddening, raw, sliced and spliced. What are the stem cells of salvation, incisions crusted, 
blood bone views contaminated with rough touches bloody body markings violent inkings groveling for innocent skin for untouched pristine uncorrupted skin thank you for listening to me so that was from the coconut girl at wild press books and this was from the barging buddhi and other poems and as i said before you can follow me at w www.blackpear.net and purchase my other book from www.wildpressbooks follow me at sunita thind dash writer facebook and also instagram and twitter at sunita thind thank you very much for listening to me i appreciated it so much Empire calling. How did I get here? Snapping on a poppadom drinking cobra beer. Who set this in motion? Dragging my father 3,000 miles across the ocean. A head full of dreams he couldn't abandon. Ended in the night shift in Wolverhampton. You see, you build your nation on mass immigration. Then you blame us for the lack of assimilation. Who set the rules that we were the bait? Chased by the skinheads on the housing estate. Where do they hide these voices of reason? An Englishman's home's his castle. To say otherwise is treason. You see, you built your commonwealth on the backs of the poor. From the east docks of Blackwell to the west Bengali shore. So don't blame the migrants, the immigrants, those poor refugees. When the empire's calling, we all sail the seas. For 500 years, they've tried to divide us, it's true. But we'll stand together, because we are the many, and they are the few. My flag. My flag has no edge or borders. It doesn't make me stand up salute. It doesn't give me orders. My flag is the color of a bloodstain. Some lost in battle, some still in vain. My flag is not a football slogan or a reason to learn to hate. My flag is the difference in humanity, something to celebrate. My flag is for my children and for your children too. My flag is for the many, not for the privileged few. My flag is not owned by kings or queens or by the nation state. My flag says break these mental chains. My flag says liberate. My flag has no spread eagle, yellow star or rising sun. My flag's an open heart. There's room for everyone. My flag is not on the side of a bank or on a dollar bill. My flag has never declared war. My flag doesn't know how to kill. My flag is not made of gold or diamonds nor does it smell of oil. My flag waves in the streets below, in the hands of struggle and toil. My flag is not the history of rulers past, it's the history we've yet to write. My flag is not here to add to the darkness, my flag is here to bring you the light. My flag is my mother's tongue, although not here to see. My flag is not here to keep you out. My flag is here to set you free. An apology to my hair. We've been together for as long as I remember, but our relationship was abusive at first. Instead of pouring love into you, I criticized you for your thirst. I let you down, tore you apart, tied you up in colorful knots, tried to drown you out in acid, and then hung you up to dry. I told you that you were ugly. You broke down in reply. 
The world didn't like you very much, and so neither did I, and I surrendered you to hands who groped you without a may I? I would bury you, then question why you kept letting me down, cut you back like rows of thorns when you were actually my crown. But you defied me, stood defiantly, and reached towards the sun, and in spite of me, your strands burst free, determined to survive. So I surrendered, listened, learned your quirks and all the things you've done, found the grains of rice you held to keep my ancestors alive. Now every night I lather you in oils, inhale you in my hands, watch you grow and shed the lies that kept my body colonized. And now I know how blessed I am to have my fro and coiling strands. I will adore you, stand up for you, and I will apologize. Boogle felt slinkly dingering down into before the time when future came, when all the Inglings mielded with the green, lived true, and empty hands received fair share, pumply soft and velveteen stroking all, till darkness fell and velging came. Slinnering, brassling, spleening xyles, and promising more, if only vinglings learn to hate and never question why. But slicking Velging's promise wasn't true, and in the tomorrow only Kleptox rose higher. Hatching plans squares big, building empires and slanking many, while vinglings vessel velgings vile and hate, and in the under, cracking spleached and bletched, and vinglings turn to splench and zile their own. Forgetting together and scorning empty hands till many hungered and the glowing was gone. Boogle pain to see the vinglings change. Simping sorrow, he wandered down into Pumply Hollow, smoogled down till wooming sleep came. And in the dreaming, the whispering wind whispered, Pogo, change will come. Culture Clash. I eat chicken on the bone with my fingers. Staff look at me and their stare lingers. Cause I'm not using a fork or eating pie of pork or ham and cheese. Oh, please stop. Before I make a police stop and arrest you mid stare. Cause personally, I don't care what you think. But tell me again my food stinks and I'll be all up in your grill. Like toast. And make you feel most unwelcome. But I really want to educate and help them. Because our backgrounds are different. I eat different food, for instance. But that doesn't give you the right to tell me it's disgusting. Carry on and I'll be thrusting it down your throat and you'll see it's nice. By the way, it's jollof rice, a staple West African dish. And yeah, it can contain fish, but it's cooked to taste. I guarantee none goes to waste. But I'm going off course here. There is a lesson of course here. And that is don't knock it till you've tried it. And if you don't want to keep quiet before we speak nonsense, because if cultural knowledge was money, you'd have one pence. When you go to live on holidays in countries like Spain, the locals think you're a pain. Every night you order steak and chips and then get pissed and shake those hits with fellow Brits. Dancing to shaking Stevens, speak fast for no reason, don't want to appease them, don't try to learn the language, but you're telling the Spanish waiter in English all your anguish and he can't understand half of it. And there lies your problem. 
well, part of it, because you want to live British abroad, get dead fat, call yourselves expats. But when foreigners do it here, they're called immigrants and abhorred for your ranks, when in fact, you should give thanks, because without them, the UK would look sucked. And if you don't believe me, you can go and get hooked on the World Wide Web and read instead of listening to tarnished views from the BBC News that lean awkwardly to the right and you watch cautiously through the night getting hypnotised by a biased mantra with so many additives it may as well be Fanta but there's nothing sweet about it with bitterness you tweet about it for hundreds to read and hundreds agree with you because not much is going on in their lives having marital problems with their husbands and their wives getting laid off at work they need to go berserk but nobody ever blames the English boss who hired them cheap labour hmm I wonder what inspired him what a joke so foreigners please take note that you will be blamed for most things while the same people are boasting about their japanese sports car sipping german beer in a sports bar posting pictures of that indian curry they're about to eat you see it's all deceit and lies there's such tenuous ties that separate us just to desecrate us and keep us from being one so power to the people there's none we are categorized and separated so togetherness is decimated into color race creed and class which evolves into one big culture clash thank you to those who sent our children to war left their minds shattered their guts on the floor disemboweling themselves for the cause so the rich get richer while the poor stay poor only to be offered a bed in a door. That's if they ever make it home at all. To your streets paved with gold, left out in the cold, but we don't forgive. And we don't forget. And we are coming for you. To those who invented the circuits of politics, audience acrobats and dancing bears too. Roll up, roll up, the head clan is bleeding while we fight each other for the right to choose. Which gaudy psychopath or rulers this time? Out with the old and in with the new. But there is no new. There is no new. Because nothing floats down here except we all float down here. And we are coming for you. To those who took the shoes from our feet. No beds left to sleep, no food left to eat, no money for electric, no money for heat, while we're sneered up by millionaire corporate tax cheats. And destitute ourselves to pay off our oppressors, suppressors, regressors, thieves and transgressors, in exchange for shit we never needed at all. But the end is nigh, you're running out of time because we are coming for you. To those who work to create the narrative, state the narrative, twist and colour and paint the narrative, white men in suits telling us who's to blame, and isn't it strange how it's never them? But your engineered hate has had its day because we see through it all. And hey, we are coming for you. To those who carve great scars in the land, Boundaries drawn in time, reinforced by sand. Both sides are starving, but the borders are manned. For fear we will realise the power in our hands. But your walls won't stop us. You can tear up your plans for here. Be dragon. And here, and here, and here. And we are coming for you. Because we make the jewels you hang from your ears. We make your cars and we drive them too. We clean your floors and we build your houses. We stitch your clothes and we mend your shoes. We make the heat that warms your penthouse. We lay your tables and we serve your food. We fix your gas leaks and unblock your toilets. We taught your parents everything they knew. We control the sound for your propaganda. Run the TV stations and radios too. We fly the planes and we drive the fuel trucks. We man the borders and we let you through. We hold the keys to the hospitals and prisons with the doctors and the nurses and the boys in blue. With a rabble, with a trouble, with the ones you abandoned, the receptionists and janitors at your children's schools. We start the fires and we put them out. We make the bombs and we drop them too. 
And one day soon, one day soon, we will be coming for you. A pensmith, I pen this as I'm pensive, attentive to the reason I'm inventive. Don't expect this collective to flex its directive on infected, rejected and hateful protectors of statues. People die, but spray painted metal attracts you. Not being blessed, but best believe that I'll at you and expose the flaws in your weak mind and bad views. Tabloids are bad news, stories that lack proof and inspire hatred. Words were once sacred, now they're manipulated and served like they're catered, tapered to cause change. So course they poor hate in a poor trait, or say, pretty England's ornate, more space, so bored they see the channel as a causeway, and that causes way too much spray of misdirected hate. But it skipped a generation. Cause growing up, for me, difference was a reason for celebration, breaking bread and penetration, different cultures and elevation, dedication, that's my final destination, desperation, that can be forsaken. Because as I walk amongst common people, I know the House of Commons is spreading common evil, forever blocking equals, so I'm just waiting for the sequel, literally. They're televised telling lies, they privatise our private lives, manipulate the modern world and hope that we don't analyse, the poison that will paralyse, the freedom that we fantasise, grim is our fairy tale, accepted like the cannons lies, on the mountain where the cannons lie. I see the battlefield, hear the battle cries, smell stagnant views and alibis. It's a fact that I am trying to see much farther. In the light of discovery, it's been much darker. We can't forgive, but we can make up for the sins of our fathers. I used to walk miles over marshes Late into bowing the pastures To fly over the bells and the smells past us Fry chicken, thigh licking bastards And high living artists Who trick the trippers into kissing asses. Middle classes, catch a minute of catharsis Pimping out carcasses, dead in them regardless Betting on the markets, police departments Knock a couple heads, pissy sergeants Gripped my garments in Hackney Signs of the empire were comical Price on the street, astronomical Nigeria, Ghana, Pakistan All follow you, where I'm from, dying and it's getting fires historical How were we supposed to Honestly speak for the streets kosher Halal grosses and leave posters Stepping aside Homeless beggars The high rollers Jackals and vultures You crack teeth in These cackling jokers Chat fracturing the black in my culture And haggling over My peas with the lack of respect I cop a pack of blue camels On the back of the deck Clocking a geezer with a gap in his neck A fact checks one Sue's reality Bust two for clarity And turn off your news for your sanity Choose solidarity Moving crews Attuned to the true gravity, I put up my black twos happily. Ahmed was just a boy who threw stones at a tank because he was fed up of settlements in the West Bank. Return to his homeland was his ultimate dream, so he stood with his brothers to protest against the racist regime. He was only 11 when soldiers beat him black and blue, threw him in a dirty prison, saying this is good for you. Told him to keep his mouth shut, or they'd send him to Guantanamo Bay. If he didn't stop following Hamas, they'd throw the key away. They sent fighter jets that night and blew up his family. Showed him no remorse, saying the house should have been empty. At 13 they set him free, but rage overcame his temperament. The land where his home once stood was now rows of Jewish settlement. He was now a homeless orphan with a fire raging inside. Revenge the dangerous motive, but he was sick of the apartheid. He felt he was worthless, no reason to be alive, so he tied a bomb around his chest and waited for soldiers to arrive. They turned up with children, so he walked away in remorse. He ran when they shouted, Stop! So they shot him down with full force. Netanyahu who called them heroes, another terrorist killed, but he was just a child grieving from the pain that they had instilled. If you know your history about the mass evacuation by an empire of sophistry and vile discrimination, 
You'd know that slavery did not end. It was politically reinvented. That's why my skin still seems to offend and my people remain tormented. Some say there is no apartheid, so I'll show them colours do not mix. Suddenly they become tongue-tied. You see, I don't miss a trick. Your heroes are Modi and Netanyahu, and you call me a bad preacher. You do not see what is before you, and you want to be my child's teacher? You talk about condemnation, but forget about colonization. When you destroyed my mother nation and raped for your gratification. You mock the struggle of the anarchist. Say it's propaganda when we resist. But your double standards still persist. And then you call me a terrorist. My little baby, lying in the shade, dreaming about the money that I am made, singing, oh boy, see Eloise, go line them tracks. My little baby, sitting in the sun, in a certain light, she looks just like her mum. My fair lady, heading out to sea, cockles and muscles and a sense of identity. Our poor father, sleeping in his grave, dreaming about a family that he never could have saved, and about a street that don't exist now, that he lived on as a kid, and I will always feel attached to it. I want to make folk ship for the kids, like Woody Guthrie did but with more money more PR and much less politics I want to follow in the footsteps of my forebears through the bushes and the briars to the mattresses and armchairs amongst the dust and industrial decay there's a burning flower made of razor blades and she'll cut your face but she'll greet you with a smile and sing a song to send you on your way and my little baby lying in the shade Dreaming about the money that I am made. Singing, oh boy, see Eloise, go line them tracks. See Eloise, go line and line and look at the big train fly right by and laugh at the rich pricks lapping up the city. Life's as shit there as here in the sticks. Still can't escape, dear mother, raining down the blows. But we can have music now wherever we go, with ringing in our ears and with stains on our clothes, with wretched skin and crooked toes. I want to make folk shit for the kids so we can reminisce on things we never were and things we only claim we did. I want to travel to the outskirts of the county where the legends tell a chalk and cheese and pitiful bounty amongst the dust and industrial decay. Okay, there's a burning flower made of razor blades and she'll cut your face But she'll greet you with a smile and sing a song to send you on your way And it goes, I had the world, but I lost it all I met my love by the gasworks wall I had a dream, but it's over now I kissed my girl by the old canal I had the world, but I lost it all. I met my love by the gasworks wall. I had a dream, but it's over now. I kissed my girl by the old canal, singing Tura Lura, Tura Lura La. I'm gonna miss you till the day I die. Fish in the rivers and the birds in the skies. I'm gonna miss you till the day I die. My little baby lying in the shade, dreaming about the money that I am made. Singing, oh boy, see Eloise, go line them tracks. Can anybody came row? Their eyes all shift to me. Clearly disillusioned, assuming that it's hereditary. But if it was followed by the statement, are you asking me because I'm black? You'd see me as confrontational and assume that I'm on the attack. Your hair looks really nice. Is it all yours? Hearing those words uttered used to shake me to the core. Questioning my authenticity, no matter how hard I tried. Making me feel that regardless of all the acceptable styles I buy, that my hair was still a novelty and it clearly didn't comply. Now I'd reply, well, I bought it, which means that it was rightfully mine and I love every part of this canvas that I was gifted to design. Do you think that I can touch it? As your fingers already go to intertwine. But when met with my reaction, you told me that you wouldn't mind. But did you know that melanated people were once put in zoos? so that Europeans could come and stare and be amused. My auntie loves Bears Hammond, but you'd know all about him. 
scooping your jaw up off the floor if I told you that my knowledge is thin? But if I propose the question, am I supposed to know because I'm black? You'd readily tell me that I'm pulling the race card and my proposition isn't based on facts. But my blackness shouldn't be defined by my ability to make rice and peas. And I'm not talking white because I'm on my Q's and P's. I'm not abandoning my culture because it doesn't conform to what you assume it to be. Yes, I love chicken and I love seasoning, but I also love a chippy tea. We all come in an range of beautiful shapes and sizes. But some of us have to withstand discrimination from those who openly despise us. And those who don't openly, but still have it built into their system. Like my friend's non-racist big brother who hoped that I didn't listen. Come here, you black bah, he shouted when beckoning his cat. It rolled off his tongue so easily until his words suddenly fell flat. And I know that there'll be people listening to this thinking, I know that I'm better than that. But a while ago, I went to a show and got repeatedly mistaken for the main act. For no reason other than the fact that we were both black. Thank you. I'm imprinting words onto pages. The ink leaves a permanent impression of my rage. It's outrageous. I've felt this way for ages since I was a child. I'm a manifestation of my own insecurities. At times I wonder was I born with these pre-bonded onto DNA molecules and wrapped around the follicles of the hairs on my crown. It feels like the wolves could simply huff and puff and blow my house down. So maybe I need to move to higher grounds, not literally, but yet literally raising my vibrations to higher frequencies, increasing my awareness of geometric sequences and connecting with the unseen elements, both essential and relevant to my quest to shed this fake skin, this societal disguise I've been hiding behind in the shadows of my true self, denying my true wealth and never quite reaching my full potential. I did not see that growth is exponential when you lighten the load, walk in the middle of the road and keep your nose to your own concerns and let your flame burn brightly. Greet your enemies politely and despite these days when the chest seems tight, we flourish under full moons and bend non-existent spoons and use our presence to fight the hidden enemy that lurks within the psyche wherever i go he goes masquerading as the truth i said wherever i go he goes masquerading as the truth and so i choose to listen to the one that never lies the heart center my spiritual mentor who guides me to all things great and good and so by ego driven people i remain misunderstood because overstanding is eloquence personified and so i'm eloquently honored by me myself and i and that's why i always strive for elevation because the healing of a nation starts with individuals taking a personal stand finding like-minded people and forming a clan drawing a line in the sand and marching to the beat of their own drums and setting pace based on rhythmic patterns which align with venus mars and saturn and prove that the earth was never flat and it keeps on spinning on its axis these are the facts which prove this world is magical and so much more than capital that little ism we're given to uphold the illusion of equality of opportunity which i prefer to call lunacy so just in case you miss that it's no time to kick back it's time to get to know yourself on a deeper level it's time to be a dopey conqueror and a soul rebel it's time to be a buffalo soldier and a small axe. So if you're a big tree, you need to fall back like autumn leaves and try angles like isosceles to make sure that all is equal on both sides so we can all strive for what we truly deserve when we see what we should truly observe and life becomes magnificent.
Shamima Begum's situation has made me question what has become of this country. Living in a society that doesn't see they are victim blaming, shaming a child. Would you do the same if it was a white girl raped by a pedophile? You think my words are vile. You think she's not a child. She was 15, groomed by grown men. She was 15, trafficked by grown men. She was 15, raped by grown men. She was 15, married to a grown man. She was 15, impregnated by a grown man. She was 15, radicalized by grown men. She was a child when she lost her children. Complaints that she shows no remorse. Haven't you heard of Stockholm Syndrome? Four years she's been traumatized. Four years she's been radicalized. Four years and three babies' lives. Yet fascists cry about Muslim pedophiles but are blind when it comes to a brown girl's rights. Breaking international law, stripping her citizenship. Sajid. Javid, you're a fucking prick. Distract, divide, conquer, the usual shit. Anything to forget Brexit or EU human rights laws getting ditched. What's in it for them? Strip your citizenship at their wish without a trial or prosecution. If this goes to court, it'll all come out. Shamima is the victim, no doubt. Let the closet racists drown in their own fear and hatred. They are just as brainwashed as Shamima. Mainstream media feeding hatred and racism. There's no debate in them. Blinkered by a narrative set in place to make you passively aggressive against a groomed kid. She did not choose this. The frontal lobe of our brain that controls cognitive function, such as judgment, social and sexual behavior, spontaneity and initiation, problem solving and impulse control, things that play an important role in who we become. Psychologically, at 15, this part of our brain isn't functioning fully. So if that's the case, how can you say Shamima is to blame? And if that's the case, why is fucking a 15 year old still considered statutory rape? For fuck's sake, she's not a terrorist threat. She doesn't deserve this. Public flogging and a witch hunt. But what if it was your white mum? A woman suffering domestic violence? A woman sexually assaulted? A white girl groomed by a paedophile? Would you throw the same vile victim blaming and shaming statements plus a bit of casual racism? Or would you have more patience? Would you have more sympathy? Would you have more empathy if Shamima's face was a different shade, maybe a bit more pale, without a headscarf or veil? There have been 400 jihadists let back in this country since 2012, but this girl is definitely the problem. Take your mainstream media goggles off. Have some compassion for a child of 15 who has been abused, taken advantage of, robbed of her freedom, and for what? Ignorant bigots to kick off. Distract, divide, conquer. You're a plonker if you're blind to the agenda. Wake up. I'm not a terrorist sympathizer. I just give a fuck about human rights and an abused child. What's wrong with that? I'd rather be compassionate than a bigoted, closet, racist twat. Think about that. Changing times. Over time, brushing the smile onto our faces before turning into the prevailing wind became a habit. 
a habit ingrained under the hoofs of stampeding herds, whose toxic clouds shrouded our pass. Parched at the end of their nostalgic tether, sensing a tug whenever we felt fail close to being quenched. But now, no longer scattered, let's step out of the shadow of their shadow. Let's draw our water from sweeter wells. This is called a lie and travel. Piss, shit and blood. Not alcohol, but piss, shit and blood. Those were the smells of that day, and the rustle of covers being pulled over the facts before the eyes of the dead. Hounds let loose to hunt, and loads of money blooding were the scents of that decade, and the dehumanising tally-ho of the scratches of the estate, creating new enemies within. Spineless vilification, fuelled in publicly subsidised bars, that's the lingering reek of this day as the hear, hear, chair snorters of Big Benocracy continue to exert traction on the truth. Do we have to live in times where a lie can travel halfway round the world before the truth ever gets to lace up its shoes? The sheep got a taste for the meat So I walk around with the flock and I sharpen their teeth It's the safest place I can be Now I'm not proud, but a man's got to eat And the wolf's got a place I can sleep Man, that wolf can bleat He's got the sheep full of hate for the meat You can taste the defeat I got some mates you should meet I know a cat plays fiddle A cow wears leather A copper eats bacon and a bird plucks feathers No one gets hurt if they don't act clever And they keep their eyes down and their lips together I mean, someone gets hurt Obviously someone does what were you thinking, step into the bunch of us? Names and places, car bombs and dumper trucks We got governments and gagging orders, shut the fuck up Call me a propagandist, it's just my job It's not like I ever planned it, it fell into my lap And you'd have done the same fucking thing So don't pretend you don't understand That the sheep got a taste for the green Read it on a banner at the bottom of the screen Read it in our manners and our values and our myths Tell the dead kid on the beach Riots don't exist And whites don't give a shit August riots, teenage pricks My CV's written and your TV's nicked I got you gripped on some high strength script Now run and ask your mates, have you seen this shit? Rub your fleece on the factory floor till you're so raw you bleed but you're back for more I got the mutton sitting knitting, it's either that or sell lamb for a living Good morning, now good evening Britain, the sheep got a taste for the meat The cow's got a pocket full of beef, the kitten's on heat It exists in you and it exists in me, these are parts of us that wish to be free New kinds of empire, new kind of missionary, new kind of mercenary, new kind of history New kind of peace, like you're finding a caged beast, like you're finding a silent child when the family's deceased New reasons to hate Easterners They keep coming here to feast on us Racist women beaters that ate freedom And we're much better We're just clean alike Please mister Save us, save us Or at least entertain us Yeah I'm just going out to get the papers Get the papers I can do both And wipe my arse at the same time Whilst appealing to your bloodline Lie after lie Steeped in Anglo-Saxon pride I can show you a good time Jack you up And then jack up the price And you're all hooked So you're all getting jacked Even if the kids on your estate ain't black, but you bought that shit like every other division. Good morning, now good evening, Britain. To be or not to be, that is the question. Well, it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing end them. To die, to sleep, no more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to? 
Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die. To sleep. To sleep, perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come? When we have shuffled off this mortal coil, must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes, when he himself might his quietus make with a bare Bodkin? Who would these fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveller returns, puzzles the will, and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of? Thus, conscience does make cowards of us all. And thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied all with the pale cast of thought and enterprises of great pith and moment with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Thank you for joining us on this Sunday afternoon for the Nottingham Poetry Festival Fringe events. Massive thank you to all of our performers, all of our sponsors, especially Arts Council England who've made this whole thing possible and even better for completely free. Head over to the website and check out the rest of the events that we've got in store for you over the next few days.